All right, so welcome to Race, Racism, and War, our first Passion Committee talk for the History Department, um, being hosted by Professor Remy's MA seminar on contemporary world history. Um, I'm not going to say anything except check the History Department Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram for more events coming your way this semester. And I'm going to turn it over to Professor Remy and Professor Napoli to a huge round of applause from everybody. <laughs> so the way this will work is that Professor Remy will speak, Professor Napoli will speak, and then we're going to have time for questions. We'll open the floor to you all making connections between the classes you're all taking and what they're talking about, asking them questions, et cetera. Okay, so go for it. Professor Remy, I guess you're first, right? In time? Uh, chronologically, yeah. Uh, 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 Professor Mancy, thank you so much for uh, all, of, all of your work in putting these, this uh, terrific program together uh, again. And um, welcome, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Uh, I'm going to get at tonight's topic in a uh, roundabout way, so bear with me for a few minutes. When most of us hear the term World War, we think of World Wars I, World War II, but there have been other attempts to define earlier armed conflicts as world wars. So Winston Churchill famously described the Seven Years' War in the mid-18th century as the First World War because it was fought in Europe, North America, and India. And a stronger case could be made for the Napoleonic Wars of the late 1700s and early 1800s. The common denominators are scale and connection. Right, so a world war is a series of armed conflicts that takes place simultaneously or sequentially in different parts of the world. The origins and conduct of these conflicts may be determined to a large extent by local circumstances, but the sites or theaters of war are connected to each other. Okay? Now, I want to propose another candidate for the title of First World War. In the mid-19th century, wars to create, expand, defend, and resist empires accelerated across much of the world. But instead of seeing them as a series of mostly unconnected colonial wars, we should consider them as an interconnected whole, as a world war. Now, for reasons I don't have time to get into, this world war subsided somewhat around 1915, but then resumed with a vengeance in the 1930s and continued into the 1970s. It's the first stage that I want to focus on here, OK? The World War that began in the mid-1800s was fought in North America, it was fought in the Caribbean, it was fought across significant parts of Africa, through the Middle East, across Central Asia to Southeast and East Asia, and in Australia and New Zealand. So we're talking about a belt of wars that encircled the world. These conflicts, they were generated by the accelerating expansion of European, Russian, American, and Japanese empires, and by the retraction of the Ottoman Empire. Now, the expansion and retraction provoked indigenous resistance. That provoked, in turn, even greater levels of violence by imperial powers. So in addition to the global scale of the imperial wars, I would argue a couple of other things connected these conflicts. And guerrilla warfare uh, as the main mode uh, the personnel, the transfer of personnel and technology. Uh, second, ideology. And here is where I think concepts of race and racism play a central role. Now, certainly, material and strategic interests drove late 19th century imperialism, and so did claims of civilizational and racial superiority. And racialized conceptions of indigenous peoples contributed to the brutality of imperialism and its attendant wars. And I think racism played out in another way, one less familiar to us when we think about 19th century imperialism. So to start with, in 1892, the British Prime Minister and diplomat Lord Salisbury described colonial wars as, and I'm going to quote him here, the surf, the surf that marks the edge and advance of the wave of civilization. Now, if that sounds like a boast, it was, but, but behind the boasting was something else, and that was fear. And I would argue that decades of colonial wars fueled a great deal of fear in the white imperial world. Now, this might seem 
counterintuitive. Fear of what? After all, imperial forces won most individual engagements, and they won nearly all ter longer-term imperial wars. And popular media at the time for adults and children in the West, in Britain, for in particular, uh, for example, frequently sensationalized the victories of, of colonial or frontier troops against so-called savages. But here's the thing. Claims of superiority took some very hard hits on battlefields around the world. So one example is Little Bighorn in what is today Montana in 1876. Uh, another is the Zulu victory over British forces in Southern Africa a couple of years later in 1789. Another was at Adawa in 1896 when Ethiopian forces inflicted on Italians and their African auxiliaries, the worst single defeat ever experienced by a European colonial power. And another uh, a key example takes place in 1905, uh, when Japan defeated Russia in a short war over Manchuria and the Korean Peninsula. Okay, now it's true that uh, Japan was, a, uh, it was an imperial power, but it was not an American or European imperial power, and it had modernized without ever being colonized by Westerners. And it would be hard to overstate how shocking Japan's victory was to white Westerners and how inspiring it was to an entire generation of colonial subjects around the world. So these defeats reinforce a point made recently by the historian Antoinette Burton about the British Empire. Most wars over imperial spaces in the 19th century were very hard fought and they were costly regardless of who won. So if you add other forms of resistance and disruption to armed insurrection, then the British and other empires, they never really, they never appear truly secure. So I would propose that decades of colonial wars fueled not just pride, but also a great deal of anxiety in the white world over the prospects of its long-term survival. So in 1893, one year after Lord Salisbury's boast about the global significance of frontier wars, the Australian writer Charles Henry Pearson published a book called National Life and Character, A Forecast. Now this was an international publishing sensation. And Pearson predicted the replacement of the white race by Africans and Asians in a way that would be instantly familiar to the contemporary transatlantic far right. Pearson's book terrified white people, uh, and at the same time, it inspired its many African and Asian readers. Now, Pearson's voice was only one of many that articulated fears of whites being replaced by non-whites. And to be sure, he was mainly concerned with global migrations, and these migrations were fueling intensified racial segregation and restrictions on immigration in self-described white men's countries. So that's Canada, the United States, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. But here, I would, I would argue that imperial wars played a role. I think it's highly significant that the two most spectacular defeats for, for imperial armies, Adawa and the Russo-Japanese War, they took place in this period, and I'm convinced they only intensified fears of white vulnerability. So a quick anecdote. It was in large part because uh, of Japan's victory over Russia and the aftermath of anti-Asian riots on the west coasts of the US and Canada in 1907 that the American president, Theodore Roosevelt, dispatches a fleet of US battleships on a world tour. And that of course included a stop in Tokyo Harbor. The hulls of the ships were, were painted white and the armada becomes known as the Great White Fleet. And I think this was simultaneously a projection of white power and an expression of white anxiety after Japan's stunning victory over the Russians. So let's go forward seven years after the publication of Pearson's book to the first Pan-African Conference in London in 1900. And here the American scholar and civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois declares the problem of the 20th century as the problem of the color line. He believes what's going on around the world was whiteness, as he called it, being asserted because white people were afraid of losing control of the world to people of color. So as an ideology that was driven by fear, whiteness was 
reactionary, it was armed to the teeth, and it was very, very dangerous. And I was struck by a metaphor that Du Bois used that was very similar to one used by Lord Salisbury to describe whiteness as an ideology of imperial war making. Du Bois said, and I'm quoting him, wave on wave with each in each with increasing virulence is dashing this new religion of whiteness on the shores of our time. So it's a similar kind of metaphor with a very different meaning. Now, on the other side, on the anti-imperial side, colonial wars and more generally imperialism and racism were inspiring an increasingly global ideological response even before communism becomes an, a major anti-imperial force. So I'm thinking here of the emerging pan movements. So pan-Islam, pan-Asianism, uh, and the pan-Africanism of which W.E.B. Du Bois uh, uh, was such a major figure. So during what I'm calling the First World War, racism and the responses to it manifested itself in multiple ways. They drove imperial war making and resistance. They etched in blood, really, <laughs> the global color line uh, identified by uh, Du Bois in London. And within imperial states, they generated this highly unstable, volatile mixture of confidence and fear. Uh, and this is a mixture that would persist well into the uh, 20, 20th century. And I think um, we can certainly uh, still uh, see it in, in large parts of the world today. Um, that's shorter than 20 minutes, but um, I'm happy to stop there and uh, we, can, uh, do, uh, we can do questions. We can do some questions in a bit. Oh, thank you, Steve. Awesome. Thank you, Professor Remy. All right, so we'll move on to Professor Napoli, I think, right? Does that make sense, Professor Napoli? Sure, I'm yeah. good. And then we'll have like a big conversation after that. Um, cool, so, so take it away. All right, I need to share my screen. Um, I uh, will do some PowerPoint work and also play a little bit of video, I think. What I want to talk about is connected to what uh, Professor Remy was discussing, but comes from the American experience. Many of you guys don't know me, so allow me to, to give a little bit of um, uh, background on who I am and what I do. Um, I am a 20th century U.S. historian. I have been working with U.S. military veterans for a long, long time now. Um, and Late, earlier this year was asked to do some talking at John Jay about race and the American experience in Vietnam, and that led to, I think, my willingness to, to participate in this conversation. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I want to talk about these various topics. Now, look, this is, Professor uh, uh, Remy would be right to be fearful. I could do the next hour and a half on the basis of what's here. Um, can everybody see this? Is it clear enough? Can I get, I got those thumbs. That's good. The, I, I just don't really think we're going to get through all of this. Um, uh, those of you who have had me in class know that I can talk an awful lot for a long time. So uh, let's start with uh, who fights and who leads. Have a look at this photograph. Um, this was taken October 8th, 2019. Um, Give me the obvious. Say it back to me in text or out loud. Just unmute yourself and talk. What's going on in this photograph? Lack of representation amongst leaders. Oh, should we say? That's correct. This was tweeted out um, by the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. Um, uh, and he writes, thank you, POTUS and FLOTUS, for hosting me and the Department of Defense leadership for dinner at the White House and for your continued leadership. Right. Um, have a look at this. This is 2019's graduation ceremony at the uh, U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, I don't spot a white face. Right. Um, 
as the country has become more and ethnic, et, more racially and ethnically diverse, so has the military, but the leadership has not. Um, racial and ethnic minority groups make up about 43% of active duty military in 2020. In 2015, it was roughly 40%. This is a vast increase from 25% in 1990. Um, African Americans in 2015 made up about 17% of uh, af active duty military, somewhat higher than their share of the population. African Americans have consistently been uh, re more represented um, among listed personnel than among commissioned officers. The share of active, the active duty force that's Hispanic has been rising rapidly, um, approximately 12% in 2015, three times the share of, 19, of 1980. African Americans are highly visible in general, but not at all in the leadership. Um, people making the crucial decisions about where to fight, such as how to respond to the coronavirus, how many troops to send to Afghanistan, Syria are almost, in, almost entirely white and male. Of the 41 most senior commanders in the military, those with four-star rank in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and Coast Guard, only two are black. General Michael Garrett, who leads the Army's Forces Command, and General Charles Q. Brown of the Pacific Air Forces. I'd like to stop this share and those of you who have had me in class know I like the kind of collaborative, collaborative thing. I want to let uh, General Brown talk for a moment. I'm going to stop that share and restart it over here. Here comes the share again. Can you see General Brown? Later in our Air Force. I'm going to back it up. Here we go. As the commander of Pacific Air Forces, a senior leader in our Air Force, and an African American, many of you may be wondering what I'm thinking about the current events surrounding the tragic death of George Floyd. Here's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about how full I am with emotion, not just for George Floyd, but the many African Americans that have suffered the same fate as George Floyd. I'm thinking about protests in my country, tis of the sweet land of liberty, the equality expressed in our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that I've sworn my adult life to support and defend. And thinking about a history of, of racial issues and my own experiences that didn't always sing of liberty and equality. I'm thinking about living in two worlds, each with their own perspective and views. I'm thinking about my sister and I being the only African Americans in our entire elementary school and trying to fit in. I'm thinking about then going to a high school where roughly half the students were African American and trying to fit in. I'm thinking about my Air Force career where I was often the only African American in my squadron or as a senior officer, the only African American in the room. I'm thinking about wearing the same flight suit with the same wings on my chest as my peers and then being questioned by another military member, are you a pilot? I'm thinking about how I sometimes felt my comments were perceived to represent the African-American perspective when it's just my perspective informed by being African-American. I'm thinking about some of the insensitive comments made without awareness by others. I'm thinking about being a captain at the O Club with my squadron and being told by other African-Americans that I wasn't black enough since I was spending more time with my squadron than with them. I'm thinking about my mentors and how I rarely I had a mentor that looked like me. I'm thinking about the sound advice that has led to my success. And even so, most of my mentors could not relate to my experience as an African American. I'm thinking about the pressure I felt to perform error free, especially for supervisors I perceived had expected less from me as an African American. I think about having to represent by working twice as hard to prove their expectations and perceptions of African Americans were invalid. I'm thinking about the airmen that have lived through similar experiences and feelings as mine or who were either consciously or unconsciously unfairly treated. Conversely, I'm thinking about the airmen who don't have a life similar to mine and don't have to navigate through two worlds. I'm thinking about how these airmen view racism, whether they don't see it as a problem since it doesn't happen to them or whether they're empathetic 
I'm thinking about our two sons. Now we had to prepare them to live in two worlds. I'm thinking about the frank and emotional conversations my wife and I have had with them just this past week as we discuss the situations that have led to the protests around our country. Finally, I'm thinking about my historic nomination to be the first African-American to serve as the Air Force Chief of Staff. I'm thinking about the African-Americans that went before me to make this opportunity possible. I'm thinking about the immense expectations that come with this historic nomination, particularly through the lens of current events plaguing our nation. I'm thinking about how I may have fallen short in my career and will likely continue falling short, living up to all those expectations. I'm thinking about how my nomination provides some hope, but also comes with a heavy burden. I can't fix centuries of racism in our country, nor can I fix decades of discrimination that may have impacted members of our Air Force. I'm thinking about how I can make improvements, personally, professionally, and institutionally, so that all airmen, both today and tomorrow, appreciate the value of diversity and can serve in an environment where they can reach their full potential. I'm thinking I don't have all the answers on how to create such an environment, whether here in PACAF or across our Air Force. I'm thinking about without clear-cut answers, I just want to have the wisdom and knowledge to lead during difficult times like these. I want the wisdom and knowledge to lead, participate in, and listen to necessary conversations on racism, diversity, and inclusion. I want the wisdom and knowledge to lead those willing to take committed and sustain action to make our Air Force better. That's what I'm thinking about. I wonder what you're thinking about. I want to hear what you're thinking about and how together we can make a difference. I, I love that. Um, uh, I love that for a, a whole range of reasons. Um, I thought it was, I mean, the rage beneath this man's voice is just that close, right? I mean, you you felt the rage, right? Um, on the other hand, there's an enormous pride in uh, an achievement never before, uh, never, be never before uh, achieved. Uh, but how did we get here? <laughs> how did we get to this place? And that's the that's part of what I want to uh, what I want to talk about. So I'm going to start a re start and reshare um, from here. After the American Civil War, the United States underwent a huge demographic revolution as cities and towns were transformed, as you all know very well, by waves of immigration, which seemed to lots of whites to threaten cultural norms and existing social structures. In the early 20th century, a great migration carried large numbers of black people out of the South and African Americans became a national rather than a regional minority. This provoked, both of these developments provoked a political and a social backlash. In the 1890s, between the 1890s and about 1915, the, the South established Jim Crow laws and racial animus grew in the North. At the same time, a parallel anti-immigration movement escalated. Harvard President Lawrence Lowell articulated the core belief. He said, Indians, Negroes, Chinese, Jews, and Americans cannot all live in a free society at the same time. The problem came with World War I. Suddenly, this country had to raise an army of millions at great speed. And there was simply no way of doing that without enlisting large numbers of African Americans and immigrants. This created a crisis. And in this crisis, leaders rediscovered what they call, what you would call ideals of civil equality, which were called into question by that late 19th century ethno-nationalism. The United States was now articulated to be described as a, a polyglot community. The democratic ideal, according to the World War I propaganda office called the Committee on Public Information, was that higher than race loyalty, transcending mere ethnic prejudice, more binding than the call of common ancestry, was an ideal to which every citizen of whatever race may rally without losing hold of the best traditions of his race and the land of his nativity. This was a new social bargain that was being offered to African Americans and to immigrants. 
which was recognition of these minorities as Americans in exchange, of course, for loyal service during wartime. Essentially, the school, the army, excuse me, the military would become a school for citizenship. And it worked. Half a million immigrants from 40 countries served during the First World War. The 77th Division, which was recruited in New York, had a very high percentage of Jews and Italians. Tens of thousands of African Americans volunteered, 371,000 of them going to France. 50,000 fought in segregated combat units. African Americans performed extremely well by any standard, although no black World War I soldier won a Medal of Honor from Congress until quite recently. Um, the first World War I African American soldier to get a medal, it happened in 1990. Most recently, Henry Johnson was given a Medal of Honor in 2015, 85 years after he died for his actions on May 14, 1918. Entire regiments were given the Croix de Guerre from France. The 93rd Division, including the Harlem Hellfighters of the 369th Infantry, were one example. Nevertheless, the behavior of black troops in combat came under attack. They were described as, by one general, lazy, slothful, superstitious, and imaginative. And once the war was over, that kind of racial animus reasserted itself in the American military. And so, I'm trying to find my mouse so I can move my slides. Uh, sorry guys, this is the Zoom world we all live in. I need to be able to move my slide. I'm feeling foolish. I can't believe I can't do it. I'm going to go on without my slides, but this is terrible. If you want, you can stop sharing and start sharing again. You might be able to find it. If I could find my mouse, I could do that. Oh. Wow, I feel stupid. This happened to me the other night. Wow. You want me to stop your sharing for you? Can you? Yeah. That'll help. Okay. I wonder if I can get my mouse back that way. Guys, I'm so embarrassed. Don't worry. But I can't. It's not here. I just don't have a clue. Oh, no. Can you unplug your mouse and plug it back in? <laughs> I feel so dumb. No worries. You can try moving the mouse all the way to one side of the screen and then up. Oh, I promise you I have been doing that. Um, all right. One more second and then I will Is dispense. It a wireless mouse? It's a wireless mouse. That's correct. That's, the, that's a problem. All right. I'm going to have to do what I can without it. In 1925, Major General H. E. Eli wrote a memorandum for the Chief of Staff of the United States Army on a plan for the employment of Negro manpower uh, in war made uh, uh, on the basis of a study at the War College in which he said essentially Negro, war, Negro troops were mentally incompetent and not capable of, um, of being used in anything other than labor battalions. But the war experience had raised political consciousness. And when the Second World War came, there was another opportunity for social change. Large scale enlistment of African American and ethnic soldiers was a necessity, once again, explicitly as a rejection of the racist ideology of Nazism, which forced a discrediting of the Jim Crow regime. Platoon movies during World War II are a good example of the way that ideology made its way into popular culture. The film Bataan, a 1943 flick, actually was a small, showed a small American unit trapped in Bataan and under 
Japanese invasion in the Philippines, which included a Jew, a Pole, an Irishman, two Filipinos, and an African American, although there were no non-segregated units in the American army. Essentially, Hollywood set aside reality to show an idealized vision of integrated America, but this, this was not re, uh, reflected in reality at all. Um, the military remained segregated. Um, there had to be a lawsuit by William Yancey to get the Army Air Corps opened um, to African-American pilots, which created the Tuskegee Airmen in Tuskegee, Alabama. Roosevelt himself would actually uh, use insist that the Navy use African-Americans everywhere, even though it didn't matter a whole lot. 1945, 95% of African-Americans in the Navy were still cooking food. Marines accepted their first black recruits in 1942, uh, training at a place called Monfort Point in Jacksonville, North Carolina, between 1942 until the camp was closed in 1949. Some Marines actually did, African-American Marines did see combat. Um, the, at Okinawa, approximately 2,000 African-American Marines participated. But blacks in the army continued to serve in segregated units under white officers. Those in Europe ended up driving trucks, essentially, and no African-American was awarded a Medal of Honor either during World War II or immediately after, even though more than a million entered the service and half of those went overseas. There were some improvements Black officers began to grow in number, approximately 8,000 by 1945. The first black general was Benjamin O. Davis, Sr. Navy had 52 black officers, including a lieutenant commander. And even Patton himself actually said, uh, talked to the tankers at the 71st Tank Battalion on Omaha Beach, saying, in, quote, you men are the first Negro tankers ever to fight in an American army. I would never have asked for you if you were not good. I don't care what color you are, so long as you're, you are going to go up there and kill those kraut sons of bitches. The segregated army continued officially and legally until Executive Order 9981, which, in which President Truman ordered the beginning of the end of the segregation of the armed forces. As a result, black men began to find the army a better employment opportunity than the civilian economy. And that, plus the lure of the GI Bill, which discriminated against African Americans, meant that the percentage of African Americans coming into the Army actually rose dramatically, from about 10% to almost 16% by 1948. It was so successful, this move to desegregate the Army, that in fact the Army ended selective service. They ended the draft and voluntary enlistment of black men in order to halt the flow of African Americans into the army. Now desegregation itself happened very slowly. The army in particular resisted. Um, the army chief of staff, Omar Bradley, a World War II hero, announced that the army would change only after America changed. Kenneth Royal, the secretary of the War Department and secretary of the army, simply ignored the directive to desegregate. He could barely conceal his animosity toward African Americans and Mexican Americans. He spoke publicly about his abhorrence of race mixing. He insisted that the army is not, he said, an instrument for social revolution. So the army that went to war in Korea in 1945 was nearly as segregated, sorry, in 1950, was nearly as segregated as it had been in 1945. Segregated units, the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments, fought in Korea as segregated units. They, went, they landed in Korea in the summer of 1950 and didn't do well for a whole range of reasons, probably having to do with the fact that they were unsupported, had outdated equipment, and were overwhelmingly outnumbered by the North Koreans in Korea. As a result of the combat record of the 24th and the 25th, arguments were made that segregated black units did not perform well under fire in 1950. There's little empirical evidence to support this, but that was the argument that was made. The military knew that segregation was a problem. They knew African-American troops resented it, and they had a bigger problem. By the end of 1950, the military was desperately in need of manpower. 
So General Ridgway, who replaced MacArthur as commander of UN troops in Korea, made an official uh, policy decision to integrate U.S. Army troops on the ground in Korea as a direct response to the shortage of combat troops. In sum, the need for replacements, including black troops, was what forced the army to integrate. It happened in an uneven, contested way. But during the Korean War, one and a half million men were inducted, nearly one quarter of those were African Americans. After the war, black draftees in the army remained at more than 13% and volunteer enlistment in the army continued to be approximately 10% until about 1965, when it began to rise again. The deal is that in this era, the army looked like one of the least segregated placed institutions in American society. We had black generals, Air Force generals stationed in Thailand, African Americans made a disproportionate sacrifice in Vietnam as opposed uh, compared to their percentage of the population. Between 1965 and 1966, about 23% of the Americans killed in Vietnam were African American. The front lines became known as Solville. 1967, 20% of the front line troops were African American, 25% of the elite troops, 45% of the airborne. 20% 20, 20 of army fatalities were black, 11% marine fatalities. There's little support, nevertheless, there's little support the charge that blacks were cannon, cannon fodder. Blacks were actually often anxious to prove themselves in combat and took those roles and wanted to resist communism. But because of structural discrimination within American society, there were fewer African Americans who had the training for the high skilled positions in the army and they ended up carrying guns. Lots of Vietnam veterans remember the interracial camaraderie of the front lines. The, the, back, the rear areas were very, very different. Racial tension was intense, Confederate flags flying from barracks and trucks, Prejudice festers, ra festers, race riots were, were known events. African Americans in Vietnam protested discrimination in punishment, in promotion, in assignment. And after 1968, racial incidents swept the army, forcing army commands to establish race relations committees. Black troublemakers were discharged, removed from Vietnam. And we've talked about the makeup of today's uh, diversity, to, 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 today's military, and its increasingly diverse composition. I'll say only one or two things more, because I know I'm going to run myself out of time. That's who, we, who fights. How we fight is also defined by race. An, an American historian of the military, Russell Wagley, has written that how we fight is always motivated by an American philosophy of war that insists on the use of overwhelming force, the elimination of resistance to the last possible degree. This is Wagley's understanding of the American way of war. War is also race making in the sense that it affords the opportunity to define who we are vis-a-vis -vis an enemy. We don't have to call all of American war making against foreign enemies genocide to recognize that there is an, an assa a, annihilationist impulse behind the behavior of American soldiers at particular moments in time. I was gonna show you slides about the Sand Creek massacre of 1864. I was gonna show you slides about the Massacre of Moros at, in 1906 in the Philippines, America's first war against Muslim insurgents. I was gonna show you slides about Wounded Knee, a place you've certainly heard of, and talk with you about the way the United States justified its behavior in uh, 
against the Indians and against the uh, Filipinos. Everybody should know about the racialized attitudes Americans took toward the Japanese during World War II. Boy, I wish I had my visuals now. Um, some amazing images. And during the war in Vietnam, the Vietnamese were known as gooks. Using that derogatory term was powerful both in Asia and in the United States. That expression, gook, and the experience Asian Americans had of fighting in a war in, in which that term was used was a significant stimulus to the Asian American civil rights movement, which took its roots in the 1970s and blossomed in the 1980s. One small quote, I'll try to end soon. In January 1971, Mike Nakayama testified at something called the Winter Soldier Hearings about his experience in basic training. One point, he's, an, he's Japanese American. He was told, stand up, turn around so everybody can see you. And so to the rest of the men, the drill instructor announced, this is what a gook looks like. So he turns around. And you remember this, he says, because this is, what the, this is what the person that you need to kill looks like when you get over there. You can sit down now, he told Mike. Now what I'm suggest, the expression gook to apply to all Vietnamese helped turn Vietnam into a slaughterhouse for the Vietnamese people. The notion was that the Vietnamese inhabitants were somehow less than human. They were animals that could be abused or killed. It gave rise to what was one at the time called the mere gook rule. If it was Vietnamese, it could be killed. Lest you think I'm making this up, Commander General of American Forces in Vietnam gave an on-camera interview uh, in 1968 to uh, filmmaker named Peter Davis. This is what he said, the Oriental does not put the same high price on life as does the Westerner. Life is plentiful, life is cheap in the Orient. As the philosophy of the Orient expresses it, life is not important. This is a lubricant for American behavior in Vietnam. It leads us in the direction of incidents like My Lai. You've all heard of the My Lai massacre. It took place on 16 March, 1968. Somewhere between 350 and 504 unarmed people were killed by US Army soldiers from Company C of the 20th Infantry Regiment, commanded by William Calley. Calley at his trial later testified that his instructions were to go in rapidly and neutralize everything, literally to kill everything. Callie did eventually apologize. For, he said only one thing in his entire life about this in 2009, he said he was sorry. Language is a lubricant for behavior. I'm not saying it's a determinant. In Iraq and Afghanistan, people who were non-Americans, often known as hajis. Now haji has two meanings in this context. On the one hand, a haji is the sidekick of a ca cartoon character named Johnny Quest, which appeared on American television for the first time in 1964. He's a, an adopted brother of the prota protagonist, Johnny Quest. He knows judo, he's smart, and so on. Haji is also an anglicized phonetic representation of a word in the Arabic language which indicates someone who has made the pilgrimage to Mecca. It's an honorific in Arabic. In Iraq and Afghanistan, it was used to conflate any person of color with all Arabs and all terrorists, leaving no room for individuals. It's the equivalent of gook. Uh, 
it leads us to Abu Ghraib. I don't see how, I, I wish I could show you these images. I don't see how you can understand Abu Ghraib without understanding the way we speak of, of other people. Abu Ghraib was a, a prison in Iraq, which some 7,000 enemy combatants were allegedly held. The 200, sorry, the 327th Military Police Battalion were charged with taking care of prisoners there. In April of 2004, CBS reported on photographs taken at the prison uh, in which the prisoners were shown in a whole range of positions. Things were done to them, including breaking chemical lights and pouring phosphoric acid on them, pouring cold water on naked detainees, raping, sodomizing men with lights, more. Eleven soldiers were eventually convicted by military courts for crimes committed at Abu Ghraib. The last thing I want to say brings us to Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden, everybody remembers the killing of Osama bin Laden in 2011. Officially, the name of the operation was Operation Neptune Spear. There was a controversy about the name of the operation to kill bin Laden. Some have claimed that the operation was in fact called Operation Geronimo, or indeed that bin Laden himself was Geronimo. There's no question that when bin Laden was shot, the word came back on the radio that for God and country, Geronimo, Geronimo. After a pause, Geronimo is EKIA, an enemy killed in action. I'm trying to draw a direct line between American behavior with regard to Native Americans and American behavior in the war on terror. I'll stop there and again with my apologies. Thank you, Professor Napoli. And you'll see that there are lots of words of encouragement in the chat saying we've all been there. Teachers among <laughs> Professor Remy's students have been there, no worries. All right, I'm, I want to open the floor to some questions. Um, you know, I have about a bajillion, but I want to let the students speak. Um, so uh, if you have a question, raise your electronic hand so I can see you in the queue and then I'll call on you and, and you can ask your question or you can make a connection uh, between Professor Napoli's talk, Professor Remy's talk, stuff you've learned in another class, et cetera, stuff you've read in the news. Okay. Connections. I was really moved um, you know, by two, two images that both of you brought up, right? One was um, Du Bois's religion of whiteness um, that Steve quoted, Professor Remy quoted, right? And this idea of a lubricant that Professor Napoli talked about, right? The sort of like power of words, the power of ideology, the power of fear. Um, and the motivation of war um, is pretty, pretty powerful. Um, Alexander, go for it. Hi, um, yes. So I wanted to speak first to, um, to uh, Professor Remy's uh, point uh, and, and then also Professor Napoli's on um, I guess I'll start with Professor Napoli's on visibility of leadership in the military. I have a little bit of personal experience for context. I served um, from 2011 to 2014. Um, and uh, I, my experience um, of, of enlisted leadership um, definitely represented that there were a plethora of Oops, Alexander, your, your audio just cut out. There was a plethora and then we couldn't hear you. Let me see if I can reconnect. Oh, you're good. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, and so there was a plethora of, of non-commissioned officers. Um, so enlisted uh, leadership that I had. Uh, and in fact, I didn't have a single um, 
white NCO actually my entire time serving. Um, however, uh, for the most part, every officer that I ever encountered, um, again, fortunately I was a little bit of an exception because I still had uh, African American officers, um, but generally every, especially from Lieutenant Colonel and up, um, those higher ranks, it, it was all, all white officers. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the, the concept of, you know, while these people are part of these communities, they don't. It happened again. Oh, Alexander, it happened one more time. You cut out one more time. Sorry. Technology. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. How's Great. The Excellent. Yeah, I was using my wrong mic, but um, but yeah. So the 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 notion that um, while a lot of these soldiers at the lower levels are represented in who is fighting, but not represented in how we are fighting, and um, I hadn't really considered that heavily, despite experiencing this, if you will. Um, and you know, uh, I also know that there was recently an article in the New York Times that just described another um, African American officer who was up for promotion, but he'd be one of three out of this entire panel of leadership. And so there is a huge lack of representation, um, both in, yeah, and just in terms of deciding how we're actually going about these things. And can't you imagine it would be different? The world, the world would look differently. The American behavior abroad would be different if people of color were in positions of authority, right? When, uh, anyway, never mind. <laughs> Alexander, you said you had something for Professor Remy, though. Is that true? Uh, you can go to somebody else for now. It's fine. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you. You're warned. Ken, go for it. Uh, thanks. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, Professor Napoli, uh, when you were giving your, um, when you were talking about the numbers of, um, of black Americans enlisted in the military, it made me think about um, something that I observed very early on in my teaching career. Um, many years ago, I worked at a school in the Bronx that was predominantly black and Latino um, students. And uh, I was told uh, one day that I was going to have visitors come to my classroom. Um, I didn't really know anything about who they were, or what they were going to do. I was like, oh, okay, sure. They're going to come. They're going to talk. Um, we had two um, enlisted men come and talk to my students about the benefits of joining the military um, as a career after high school. And I was pretty, uh, I was pretty surprised uh, that that was even happening because that wasn't even anywhere close to something that I would have experienced in my high school. Um, for context, I went to school in Evanston, Illinois, Evanston Township High School, very diverse high school. Um, but this idea that, um, and I don't have a tradition of military service in my family. So this idea that, um, you know, the military was a viable career option after high school was something that never even occurred to me. And then I discovered that it's actively marketed to uh, public high school students. And then um, also right around the corner from our high school, which is, this is around many other high schools, but there was a, um, an enlistment center. Uh, right around the corner. Um, so it just made me think about the ways in which, um, you know, disadvantaged members of our society are sort of coerced, pressured, lured into um, military and police service. Um, so I just wanted to share a little connection. I think you're dead right. I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't have anything to, to, to amplify that. That's great. Think of it as an economic draft. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I hear, I, and I'm, I, I'm still teaching, and you know, many of my students say, I would like to join the Navy, I would like to join X, Y, Z branch of the military, um, because it's a good career option. And, you know, I, I, I can't really fault that and respect that, but it makes me wonder, right, why, um, why is this the better career option um, that, you know, is uh, able to be pursued by students and people of color? Um, and it's because so many other pathways are closed off to them. Professor Remy, what's the, what's the makeup of the troops of the various places? I mean, I know you're talking about a lot of different countries, but um, when you're talking about wars in the, in the period you're discussing, 19th, early 20th century, do we have any diverse troop makeup? Uh, in colonial wars? <laughs> 
Oh, oh yes, but not quite in the way that you, you, you might think. Uh, it surprises uh, a lot of people to hear that, uh, uh, particularly for the British and the French, uh, when it came to their colonial wars, most of their personnel very often were, were, uh, were auxiliaries, were, were indigenous auxiliaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the African context, they were generally known as Ascaris. Uh, and um, uh, they, in most colonial wars, uh, certainly fought by the Europeans, uh, they did the bulk of the, uh, of the carrying and a great deal of the fighting, if not most of the fighting. Uh, and this really complicates things, uh, it, it, uh, I think. Uh, now, this wasn't the case across the world. It was much less common in the United States, for instance, uh, that is, uh, the, the army's reliance uh, on um, on uh, Native Americans. There was some of that, but not nearly the extent uh, that, that there would be in um, in Africa and Asia, especially Africa. Uh, so uh, there's been a good deal of research on this um, uh, aspect of 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 colonial uh, of colonial warfare. Um, so I think you could come at it in a number of different ways. Um, uh, you know, colonial, uh, and I'll just add quickly to that, uh, um, there were implications at the time, of course, for colonial wars, but also some pretty severe implications in post-colonial societies, especially when it comes to the memory uh, of colonial wars. Um, who fought for who? Uh, becomes uh, a kind of uh, uh, becomes a uh, can become a, 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 a political and, and social dividing line in uh, in post-colonial societies in Africa and Asia, in particular the Caribbean. Um, uh, so that's a whole other that's a whole other dimension, complicating dimension to this too. Okay, cool. So Andrew, you're next, and then we've got some stuff at the in the chat. Go for it. Um, Professor Napoli, talk about the race issue during the first Gulf War. You know, I'm not, I'm not prepared. I'm, I, I just have to be completely candid and say that, um, especially considering that Colin Powell was mm -hmm. general and I, I, I'm just going to defer and, and tell you that I, I will, with with pleasure, um, give some thought to to that. Of course, the lead, uh, Powell, you know, being a New Yorker and all that stuff, um, coming from my neighborhood, um, Vietnam vet. But I don't think it changed. I mean, Powell was so embedded. <laughs> Powell himself was so embedded in the military hierarchy that I don't think it changed his... Um, I have to think about it, Andrew. I'm straight up. I have to give that some thought. Thank you for the question. I Lauren, think... could I? Oh, yeah, go for it. Just... Please. Before you go to the, the, the chat, I, Phil, just to, for clarification, what was the context of General Brown's statement? I mean, he's an, he's an active duty, very high, high ranking um, active duty officer. And it's, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's fairly unusual for high-ranking active duty officers to make public political statements. Except uh, that it wasn't political, right? I mean, that's the, that's the thing about it. It's about, he, he, he has been placed in a position of nomination to be chairman, uh, to be uh, the uh, 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 chief of staff of the Air Force um, and was asked um, about sort of what he's thinking about in, the, in this broad context. And he gave his is what I am personally thinking about. And it was uh, actually, you know, a big splash when it came out because it felt and sounded like a rebuke to the Trump administration. Um, although the content of it didn't contain that. Um, right. It was by implication a rebuke. Uh, I think he was also making a claim, broadly speaking, that I'm a black man and I'm not going to ever stop being a black man just because I happen to be the chief of chief of the Air Force, mm -hmm. right? And to ask me to think otherwise is incorrect and you should know this about me. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I can offer as a matter of context. Does that come close? Yeah, so that's interesting. 
Isaiah, I, I don't know if you're able to talk, if your audio is working, but do you want to talk yes, about what you wrote in the chat? Many, yes, I had so many questions. Awesome. I, I thought I was going to forget it, so I just typed it in. But it was pretty much speaking to both great presentations, but then it's like, what's next? Like, how can we kind of invoke this change with all of the members in, in the Zoom chat who are future educators in the school of schools in the DOE system, or who do we need to speak to in terms of policy changes to kind of get this conversation going? Because it, it sounds like to me, not just this chat or these platforms, it just sounds like to me more people are listening now than ever before under the, you know, unfortunate circumstances with the, you know, the deaths that's been going on, you know, by police brutality and just, you know, the list goes on, but I just, I just think if we start with our youth, kind of, you know, black, white, no matter what the race is, getting them to understand love and, you know, understanding like not seeing color, but also giving them the background of why things are the way it is. That, that was just like kind of my thought process as I was, as I learned a lot from both of the, uh, and it was much appreciated from both of the uh, presentations. Well, uh, Isaiah, at the risk of, I mean, utterly shameless self-promotion, uh, I mean, I'm just looking at the, the question you typed in the, the chat box. I do teach a course, undergraduate and graduate level uh, course on the imperial world at war in which I talk about um, what I talked about at the start of this and then uh, much more. Ken Spala can uh, endure that class and can uh, tell you uh, the graduate version of that class and can tell you about that, uh, more about that, but um, I, it's my, part of it is my own uh, uh, um, interest in, in rethinking uh, a significant part of modern world history uh, and um, uh, in a way that is uh, um, uh, not Eurocentric and which is uh, somewhat odd for me in a way because I am primarily a scholar of, of uh, of modern Europe, but it's been um, uh, it's been a great experience for me as an educator. Now, my students, you can ask them. Steve's work is to is to take the Du Bois claim that the problem of the 20th century is is the problem of the color line and place that at the heart of his thinking, right? Um, and so, what is that? How does that reconceptualize what we imagine as World War? Well, I think that uh, Professor Remy's walking down that road. Um, if you ask me what you do as a, as a, sec, as a secondary educator, you want to bring this, not, this level of knowledge. You invite some vets into your classroom. Let them talk to you about what war and race look like. Um, and if you really want to find those folks, come talk to me. I'll, I, I, these are my friends. And if I could add just one more thing about that, Isaiah, uh, 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 and maybe this will be relevant to anyone who is a teacher, wants to be a teacher. My main inspiration for trying to rethink what we think about, uh, what we, in the, at least in the Anglophone Western world, think about World War I and World War II, the principal inspiration were, was Brooklyn College students. Uh, my the background of Brooklyn College students uh, were bringing the world to me, but I would frequently ask myself, well, am I do really doing the same in return when I, you know, was thinking about, well, here's another lecture about D-Day, here's another lecture about the Psalm. Uh, and no, uh, <laughs> was kind of my answer, and, and uh, it bothered me enough that I started really um, uh, uh, trying to, to rethink at least this little uh, uh, part of, uh, of world history. Awesome. That's, yeah, so cool. In case you guys think that we don't get from you as much as, as, as you get from us, if you get anything from us. Uh, Professor Troyansky, you're next. Well, thank you. Um, thanks to both you guys for your presentations and Professor Mancia also for organizing. Um, I, um, this is to pick up a little bit on what Steve Remy was just saying. Um, I'm familiar with uh, the debates about um, what is the first 
war and should we see the seven years war as that and what's the first total war and should it be the Napoleonic Wars and so on. But what, what strikes me is the, um, the putting together of things that we often think of in different categories in different parts of the world. Um, and Steve, the, uh, the argument you're making is one that, um, that makes me wonder how much is derived from living through this moment, at, by this moment, I, I, I guess I mean the last few months, but I also mean the last few years, yeah. um, that we are used to seeing things happening in different parts of the world within a common sort of context. Um, are you seeing ways in which people in the late 19th century were doing the same thing? Hmm. Or, so how much grows out of that material and how much grows out of your, your being an early 21st century scholar? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and I have to confess, I, I, it's one of those things where I, now, that you, now that you mention it, <laughs> Uh, I think that there probably is a connection there, especially when um, I, I think about how, when I look back at the late 19th century, how interconnected the world is becoming in its own way, in, in its particular context. Uh, but then again, also how uh, much uh, reaction and defensiveness there is uh, and uh, rising, uh, uh, nationalism and the kind of um, uh, violent reactionary uh, ideology of whiteness that uh, that Du Bois identified. Uh, so I think that there's a there's a parallel there too. That probably uh, when I think of when I think about the the, the mess the world is in now, uh, uh, there was probably some seepage <laughs> uh, between the way I was thinking about now and and then then and then and now if that's not too um abstract all right alexander all right can we hear me this time okay um uh professor remy so i my question was that when we're looking at um this earlier uh section of war across the world and you know we do know i i personally know you know of many times that um african americans uh you know uh, indigenous native americans in the united states uh prove themselves in battle if you will why why in your opinion were were um the broader uh military powers and governments so reluctant to um induct them and uh, you know, pushing on to where Professor Napoli was speaking, wh why did it take until 1948 for the U.S. government specifically, as well as some of these others? You know, we see um, it in the, as early as the Revolutionary War, uh, Britain is offering freedom to slaves um, and uh, offering them, you know, if, they, if you fight for the crown, you, you will be able to, you know, I mean, essentially saying, come fight for us and we will free you of, of the bonds of slavery in America. You know, and meanwhile, you also have the 54th Massachusetts in the Civil War that, you know, fought very bravely on, you know, multiple accounts. And yet it still takes arguably two, three centuries for them to be integrated. And, and even still, it wasn't, you know, with acknowledgement, it was pulling teeth to do so. What was, so what's your, what's your opinion as to why that took so long and, and why that occurred in the manner that it did? Just, I'm, I'm sorry, Xander, just to, to, to clarify, when you say when it took so long, you're talking about integration? Or? Yeah, yeah, well, not just, I mean, and, and just general acceptance. I mean, I think you, you touched on the point that they were seen as lesser, um, you know, uh, despite the, the context and, you know, the Ascari even fighting in Ethiopia, um, you know, were, were given lesser weapons uh, to their, their Italian counterparts. Um, and their imperial counterparts. And again, despite all of this, we see them consistently fighting and winning battles for these empires, but yet they're never acknowledged in that way. Uh, well, I wouldn't say never, uh, uh, because there were instances in which, uh, in which uh, uh, the, the French, the British governments uh, 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 would uh, uh, 
try to uh, celebrate, the Italians did this also, uh, it, try to celebrate the, uh, or portray in a very particular way uh, that, that loyal colonial subjects were fighting for the mother country, okay? Uh, uh, but, um, uh, but my, my first, uh, quickly, my first response to, to your, your bigger question, uh, I think the colonial context, uh, uh, the existence of colonialism, it was just absolutely fundamental. Once that, once that, once that bracket was broken, uh, and, and you, 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 you get into, um, I don't want, I don't want to say another world, but I, but it's a really a di very different kind of world. Uh, and I think that those can, when you ask why it had that, to, why did it take so long? I think that one of the reasons it took that long globally was, uh, it was the, was the existence of formal colonialism, colonial, uh, relationships and, and, the, and the constraints and the hierarchies and the systems, uh, that all of that worked throughout every aspect of, of, of colonized societies, including, of course, um, the military. Professor Sengupta. You're muted. Well, I want to thank our speakers and um, for their wonderful presentations. Um, despite Phil, the technological challenges. You did a great job. And Lauren, thanks for uh, arranging this and our wonderful students for your thoughtful questions. Um, I wanted to pick up on a couple of uh, points that you guys raised. One was Andrew's um, question about the Gulf War, right? So I want to share an anecdote. Um, a few years ago, I met these scholars from Iraq. They were Fulbright scholars um, who were in the US to, at the uh, Multinational Institute of American Studies at NYU. They were here to study American history. They're all, uh, they're all uh, specialists um, in American studies, but they're teaching, you know, this is Fulbright, so they're teaching all over the world. Um, so, and I uh, had been invited to uh, give a talk on African American history. And so, this um, during the Q and A uh, period, uh, this Iraqi woman uh, said to me, "You know, um, the face of America. You just talked about. Uh, you just historicized uh, the." Uh, question of race. You historicized racism. You talked about, uh, uh, you know, the bipolar construction of American society into black and white, the dehumanization, the, you know, late 19th century uh, disfranchisement, segregation. But in Iraq, the face of the American military is black. For uh, to, to us, it, it's like, that when we think of America, so she was sort of uh, talking about the irony of this because um, uh, people of African descent were so, and people of color generally were overrepresented in the military. And she was saying that, you know, can you reflect on the irony of this? That when people abroad think about the American military, what they think of are um, people of color, mm -hmm. uh, men of color. Um, so, um, th so, so that sort of complicates your narrative about uh, racism. Anyway, so, so I, obviously I don't know uh, uh, very much about the dynamics of race within the US military during the Gulf War, but it was interesting to me, you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, reflections, the perceptions uh, of this Iraqi woman uh, on that front. Um, but I also wanted to address the question of uh, American reluctance to place arms in the hands of black men. Why do you guys think that was the case? Uh, Go back to slavery times. 
Um, two words, not, not, not Turner. Oh, yeah. Slaveholders were terrified, right? Uh, people of African descent were not allowed to have arms. And it was not just enslaved people because the, the thought of, remember Lincoln, when he, after the Emancipation Proclamation, which uh, authorized the raising of African-American troops. He wrote, I mean, that was a strategic decision too. He wrote Andrew Johnson, remember? That the very sight of thousands of black men armed to the teeth will stop the insurrection at once. It will strike terror into the hearts of the Confederates. Because the, the, so the specter of slave insurrections, the specter of Denmark VC, of, of Nat Turner, I mean, that was a huge part of Southern paranoia, right? Slaveholder paranoia. So even free Black people, as you know, in American history, were not allowed to hold uh, about, to, to bear arms in large parts of the country. We even uh, saw that in nineteen sixties with the Black Panthers. Yeah. I mean, when you saw, when you had Black Panthers running around with guns, people were so fearful of that that they passed gun control laws. Obviously, you also had the assassinations of that decade. But the the prospect of Black Panthers and other activists running around with guns scared the hell out of a lot of people and that's why you had those um bills the prospect of armed black vietnam vets um in american cities was powerfully terrifying to um, american whites men trained in violence not mm -hmm. just guys with guns mm -hmm. um this is a, a yeah a real component i think of of some of the some of the great white backlash of the 1970s is this idea that somehow or other um, in, intelligent trained men with weapons yeah. represent a profound threat to the to the racial order i i think that's right yeah as far as the colonial armies were concerned though our people the colonized always formed the bulk of the army right um but it, it, within the british empire for example the mm -hmm. british racialized the in British Asia, they racialized the colonized in certain ways. So for example, you take South Asia, they constructed the Muslims as marshals. So let's put them into the army. Hindus are, uh, they're, they're vegetarian, they don't do war. So we'll send them to the, into the civil service. And so, um, in fact, uh, there was a good bit of, prof I'm not an expert, obviously, on South Asia, so Professor Banerjee will be able to tell you more about this. But within uh, uh, the empires, French as well as British, um, there was a good bit of racialization that happened in connection with uh, recruitment for the military. It, it was very much the case in Africa too, Gunja, as I'm sure you know, um, that this idea of so-called marital races, mm -hmm. let me try that again, martial, yeah, not marital, right. um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. races, the, the famous Gurkhas in India, and uh, it, but also exactly. the, the same, the and same the kind of, yeah, yeah the, the, the same, very much the same process in uh, colonized Africa. Yeah. I would like to hear David speak on that in the French experience, in, in Indochina in particular. Um, uh, the, I don't know very much about the French 19th, cent 19th and early 20th century experience with uh, uh, the Vietnamese and Cambodians and, and Laotians, uh, uh, but can you speak to, to the way they might have used their native their uh, ar ar armies um no i really can't i uh, i know much more about what was going on in uh, french colonies in africa uh than in um indochina so i'm gonna uh i'm drawing a blank on that um one thing i was going to say is that um there were also uh debates over and there were protests over 
pension policies for colonial troops um, uh, in um, actually in both world wars um, that they weren't um, uh, compensated in the way that um, the French troops were um, French from uh, the hexagon of France. Um, so uh, that kind of inequality, I mean, that this presence, but then there was this um, inequality that extended on into the post-war periods. But sorry, Phil, I can't. <laughs> So one thing that students ought to get out of this is we don't have all the answers. We have lots of questions. Um, you have lots of questions. We haven't got all the answers. It's okay. But if I could add just one thing, I, I, uh, when I gave a version of this talk uh, um, to a seminar in Scotland earlier this year, I, um, there, there was an Africanist in the, in the audience who took me to task for, uh, correctly, uh, for uh, really not paying attention to a very rich historiography on early modern indigenous war making and, 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 and pra uh, practices of warfare in Africa. Uh, and as I, as I later <laughs> learned, there's this incredibly rich uh, emerging historiography about this. Uh, and so you have uh, 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 indigenous tr uh, 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 traditions of uh, warfare in, in pre-European contact settings, and then that merges with European contact. Uh, and then it starts traveling around the world, right? I mean, the, the, Brit the, the soldiers the, and, and, and the personnel of the British Indian Army served in the Middle East. They served in Africa uh, and other parts of Asia. Uh, uh, and so there's this, this, this incredibly complicated system of of transfer that takes place. One of my very favorite anecdotes actually comes out of the uh, very late French experience in Indochina when uh, the, 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 the French army took uh, North African Algerian soldiers to fight with them against the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And then when the Vietnamese captured some of them, the Vietnamese interrogators went to them speaking in French and said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here fighting us? You should be back in Algeria doing what we're doing fighting the French, and they did. <laughs> uh, uh, so it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, an it's an incredibly uh, complicated, globalized, uh, both local, localized and globalized uh, 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 mix of traditions uh, and uh, transfers, uh, far more complicated than I'm afraid that I um, w was able to, to present it here. Michael, you're up. Yes, um, I did have a question, uh, I guess for Professor Napoli, but anyone really. Um, do you say the military is, how does the military serve as a kind of a census test for where society is regarding civil rights? And um, I guess it's secondary to that, uh, what role should the military be playing uh, in these kind of conversations? as a census test for civil rights. In other words, is it appropriate to, I'm just trying to rephrase the question slightly. Is it appropriate to use the military as a, as a, a location for social engineering? Is that kind of what the question is? Or um, uh, help me I'm help more historically. Like if you look at the way the military treated um, uh, different ethnic groups in the 1950s, would that parallel Mainstream society, were they on the same page or were they in different locations? Uh, um, and how much does that shift through the ages? Modern day, I'm asking, should, should the military be a banner for civil rights? Or should, like the general said, should they kind of be the last part of society that evolves? Um, one of the arguments that I was trying to articulate was that African Americans in particular saw the saw military service as an engine of social opportunity and they were willing to take advantage of it to to a degree that frightened actually the the power structure the military power structure so that they were it, it, it isn't just the case that um, the the military as an institution should should or should not be um, a tool for social change rather people are going to use it <laughs> um, the way they want to use it and with the way they see the opportunities um, in the 1950s and 1960s to repeat um, it really looked like the great green machine one of 
many of my African American um, uh, uh, Oral, uh, oral history participants wanted to tell me that this really looked like a good thing. I could get technical training. I could potentially even pay for college. If it cost me two to four years, that was an okay bargain, right? And as a direct result, African Americans took these jobs in like the Airborne uh, because it offered them greater pay, greater opportunity for education within the military system. Uh, they, they, people, use the system that, 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 uh, that is available to them. When it comes to contemporary American society, do remember that it's, it's actually in the military that LGBTQ rights were first fought in the 1990s under uh, Clinton, right? That was the place where the, the conversation got cooking, right? And it was only in the, in the Obama years when we finally had the Supreme Court acknowledge the, the legitimacy of, of, of gay marriage. So the, the, the institution of the army, the military broadly speaking, um, uh, can be a place where social change really does happen. Um, I'm especially interested in this in this phenomenon from the perspective of the veteran side of the the other side of the service. Once you're discharged, right? Um, because from the perspective of the VA or the Veterans Administration, uh, you're all the same. Quite literally, it makes liter no difference uh, what your it, the veterans are the only group that is um, contains all races, all sexual or orientations, all political orientations. It's the great place where um, everybody is supposed to be treated absolutely equally um, within, within the VA. I think that's, I think that's appropriate and correct. Um, I think it's that, that change that direct is forced by the people inside the institution. I'm not sure my answer was, was adequate to you, but. Um, uh, on a related note, Professor Napoli, what about this controversy about what do you think about this controversy about the rise of critical race theory in the government and how it may affect the military issue of critical race theory that's been a controversy lately what do you think about that issue are we talking about um the 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 Trump administration attack on critical race theory in, in various locations over the last couple of weeks. Is that where you're making reference to? Yeah. Andrew? To the, the whole idea, the prospect of it as a whole. I'm going to pass on the question, Andrew, not because I, I, I'm not interested in it, but because I don't feel adequately prepared to, 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 to offer an intelligent answer. Does anybody else want to jump into that one? Andrew, do you have in mind, uh, uh, um, the, some of the current occupant of the White House's statements were on the 1619 project. Uh, yeah. Is, is that, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that part of what, what you're, what you're getting at? Um, no, because like there's been much controversy lately about the rise of critical theory. There's been a lot of people talking about the issue of, but never mind. that's, mm -hmm. you can't, I think I think this actually connects really well with what Isaiah was saying a little bit earlier, right? Um, and you know, it's it's an interesting thing. Um, so many of you are about to be teachers, right? To think about what histories we teach and what histories we don't teach. Um, and prof uh, professor, excuse me, President Trump uh, has ideas about what histories we should be teaching. Um, and one of the really interesting things I think about both Professor Napoli and Professor Remy's presentations is that they're showing how even within their own educations as scholars, right, they've learned a different history from the history that they're trying to tell now. Um, and that, you know, sort of the, the education that we try to give you guys in the history department, where we're trying to teach you about how history is to told in addition to the content of the history told right um, is part of what you have to to teach while you're you're a historian while you're a history teacher while you're a student of history and it's really neat to watch both professor Rebbi and professor napoli do that kind of transforming um, in these presentations that they're giving alexander I, uh, I just want, I heard someone earlier, I, I think it was um, either Isaiah or Ken that when they were talking about, I know Ken talked about having um, people come visit his class and it was soldiers that were pitching, um, so essentially recruiters and Isaiah asking, 
you know, how, how we can uh, make change. I just want to say that there's an enormous difference in having, um, especially for those of you that will be educators, having recruiters come into your classroom and having veterans come into your classroom. Uh, you get drastically different perspectives um, and a reminder that recruiters have a vested financial and um, career interest in you know, um, selling only the best of what it can be in terms of a social mobility tool uh, for those that need it um, or are you know, more on the desperate side. Um, and again, I can say that I've been there um, and, and yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there since <laughs> before I forgot. Professor Napoli and Professor Remy, is there anything else you want us to discuss? Questions, other questions, statements, last points? May I say something about race and memory in war? Mm, um, I, I wish I had been able to get to my slides. <laughs> I feel very, again, apologetic that there is a, a way in which public memorials to American soldiers have changed, I think, dramatically in the last 25 to 30 years. There is a much more inclusive vision of who serves in the American military. Uh, if you look at the, the memorials that have been built from San Antonio to Washington, DC, um, uh, many of you guys, I, I hope, have been down to Washington to the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Um, I, if you haven't gone, please. I have. It's, it's great. It's, it, it's a deeply moving yeah. location. Um, one of my um, dear friends in oral history uh, part, collaborators, uh, Tony Wallace, um, passed away this summer. Uh, he was a, um, a yellow hat at the wall. Uh, yellow hat is one of the volunteers that will get a rubbing for you if you know a name on the wall that you would like to have. Um, and they participated by washing the wall. Tony stood by the Three Soldiers uh, Memorial, an African-American man, deacon in his church, um, served in Vietnam in 1970, was wounded pretty badly. Um, when he became a volunteer at the wall, where he wanted to be was by the Three Soldiers Memorial. Um, it was a location away from the wall itself, but rather up the hill um, looking down. He wanted to be there because there was a black man represented in the Three Soldiers Memorial. And that was meaningful for him. He wanted people to know that he was there, right, as represented in the statuary. Um, you take a few steps away and go to the Women's Memorial just down the pathway, um, a, a statue made by a, a woman named Glenna Goodacre, uh, three figures there um, a surrounding a wounded American soldier. Um, they're identified colloquially as faith, hope, and charity. Um, hope is the woman who's standing there looking for an arriving helicopter. Um, she is African-American. You can find African-American faces finally in the American memorials to, uh, to military service. It was not true 25 years ago. It really wasn't. Um, and that's, I think, a, a profound step forward um, in public acknowledgement of, um, of uh, minority uh, American military service. Uh, we'll see where the, the Gulf War memorials go. They're not built. I had a question. I don't want to go for I it. Just, Mark. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know, like, what are your thoughts on like neo racism and like how could we as a society like implement like new ways of like fighting against that? Is that even like, I mean, I don't know if that should even be for this discussion, but I'm just wondering, you know, among what, veterans in particular, there's a there's, not, yeah, I mean, throughout the whole society as a whole, I would think. Let me say something about veterans. Hard question. Because I, 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 I can't speak to like, how do we fight racism broadly? Um, there is a, uh, an argument that's made that when men and women leave military service, they need some time to process out in a fashion that is not simply here is your DD-214 or here are your discharge papers and thank you for your service and we'll see you later. There is an, a, a need for, for decompression time in which you unlearn some of the things you learn as a soldier. Some of the things that are absolutely vital to survival on the battlefield are run actually counter to what you need to do and be to survive outside the military. Um, and giving soldiers the opportunity to, 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 to untrain um, might actually address some of this stuff because many of these men and women who get attracted uh, to right-wing movements, paramilitary movements, and it's a real phenomenon right now, um, uh, 
are replicating some elements of their military experience in these yeah. uh, in these uh, volunteer militia type of groups. Um, this is one way it seems to me we could institutionalize the return of soldiers from their military service. I think it would be very wise um, and uh, potentially very productive. Um, my two cents worth about that. Gotcha. But Mark, I'm going to use your question to advertise for the coming passion events for the rest of the semester. Maybe by November, we'll have just a little bit more of an answer for you. Um, and, you know, you can keep taking classes in the history department to continue to finish off your answer. And you can keep living your life to continue to finish off your answer, too, for that really complicated sure. question. Thank but you. Thank you guys all for coming. Thank you, Professor Napoli and Professor Remy for fantastic presentations and answers to questions. Um, I'm going to just say one more time, guys, that there are so many passion events this um, semester. You can find them on the Facebook page, on the Instagram, on the Twitter. You can email me for your own personal PDF. Um, so hope to see you all there. Professor Remy, do you need to talk to your students or anything like that? No, not at all. Uh, okay. We're done. Awesome. All right. Good night, guys. Thanks again so much. Thank you, Thank you. Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank Appreciate you all. It. Thank Great guys. conversation. Good night. Good night. Tell me how to turn off my computer without a mouse. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Un Unplug the thing. Unplug.